Good morning. It is the seventh Sunday after Pentecost, and once again, after a short break, we gather together to celebrate God. We gather in the presence of God. We gather to worship and praise. We gather in joy and expectancy. We gather in beauty and wonder. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Speak your word of life to us, O God. Creator God, in you we live and move and have our being. You alone have been our help and guide through good times and bad. You alone give us the strength we need to face the challenges around us. You alone will be rest for our bodies and souls. To you we turn for wisdom. In your presence, we will find the peace and comfort we long for. Fill us with your spirit in this time of worship. Open our minds and hearts so that we may see as you see, love as you love, and follow your ways for the sake of Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And now the Jubilate. Be joyful in the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness and come before his presence with a song. Know this, the Lord himself is God. He himself has made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and call upon his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and that his faithfulness endures from age to age. The Collect for this Sunday. O God of Jacob, you speak in the light of day and in the dark of night when our sleeping is filled with dreams of heaven and earth. May we be open and watchful to your presence in our midst through Jesus Christ, your dream made flesh. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of Genesis. Jacob left Beersheba and went towards Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. And he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth, the top of it reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and to your offspring, and your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob woke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning, and he took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. He called that place Bethel, but the name of the city was Luz at the first. The word of the Lord. In the days to come, the mountain of the house of the Lord shall tower as the highest of mountains and be raised above the hills. There shall all the nations flow. Many people shall come and say, Let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, that we may walk in his paths. For the law shall go out from Zion, from Jerusalem, the word of the Lord. He shall judge between the nations 
and to side for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning knives. Nation shall not lift sword against nation. They shall never train for war again. O people of Jacob, come. Let us walk in the light of the Lord. A reading from the Gospel according to St. Matthew. He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, Collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples approached him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers. And they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Let anyone with ears listen. The word of the Lord. I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our gospel reading this morning gives me nightmares. The last time I preached on this gospel, I had traveled from London to Tanzania, a trip of about 24 hours. I arrived at the Holiday Inn at 11 o'clock at night when a bishop from Uganda told me I would be preaching at the opening service of a gathering of bishops from Africa, Canada, and the United States on this gospel. Not a lot of warning. I figured it was only 30 bishops I could wing it. I arrived at the cathedral. There were 700 people in the cathedral, and I had to preach with a translator. It was not my finest homiletic moment. I still shudder thinking about it. These are harsh words, harsh words in this gospel. And, and they're words that you'd like to avoid, and they're words that in some ways you're happy come in July when most of us are on holidays, so we don't have to preach about them. Tom Wright says that one of the problems is that today, today most people read these words as a kind of post-mortem judgment and punishment for sinners and, and non-believers. You know, some are in, some are out, some are going to heaven, the rest need to invest in asbestos. But Tom Wright says, not so fast. We need to understand the first century context of the language which was being spoken to a first century audience. John Dominic Crossan, I, I think, beautifully summarizes the faith context of the people of God that Jesus was speaking to. When he said it was the belief of the people of Israel that a just and righteous God 
created the world and chose Israel to be to be a witness, to be a symbol, to be a beacon of justice and peace to the world. But the world is profoundly unjust. And the people of Israel had experienced more than their share of imperial injustice. And so they waited for, they longed for, they prayed for the day when God would come and put things right. When God would come and get rid of violence and warfare and oppression. When God, through a military Messiah, would win victory over Rome and give them long-lasting peace and prosperity. That was the vision. Well, Jesus came, and what he brought to the people of Israel was a profound paradigm shift. See, he came and he talked about the kingdom of God, and he invited people to dream. He invited people to dream about what the world would look like if people lived it according to Yahweh's values, God's values. He invited them to dream about what the world would look like if the people of Israel really lived as the blessing to all nations that God had called them to be. He invited them to dream about what the world would look like if the people of Israel really were a beacon of justice and love and peace. He invited them to dream about a world with no pain, with no suffering, with no hatred, with no racism, with no war, with no death. He invited them to dream, to dream. But he did more. He created a kingdom movement, a movement which was a non-violent resistance to the excesses and the violence of Rome and of a religious hierarchy that was in collusion with it. It was a movement that was committed to the dream. It was a movement that was committed to the kingdom of God. It was a movement that was committed to transformation. And we need to know, it's important for us to know, that when Jesus talked about the end of the age, he was not talking about the eradication of the world. He was not talking about the extermination of humanity. He was talking about the transformation of the world, the transformation into the world, into the place it was created to be. The first words out of Jesus' mouth in Mark's gospel, the first gospel written, were repent and believe the good news of the gospel. Turn away from all of the things that get in the way of the kingdom and turn away from your agenda for violent revolution against Rome. Trust my agenda. Trust me. Trust love. Our gospel today, this parable, which is read by so many people as all the folks that I disagree with are going to burn in hell, is not about that at all. It is a continuation of Jesus' invitation, his summons for his listeners to live into the kingdom and to live with patience and it is a reminder to them that any kind of violent uprising against Rome 
would have dire consequences. So when the people say, Master, the weeds are going to choke out the wheat. Shall we go in and get rid of them? They were talking about getting rid of Rome and the hierarchy of the Hebrew religion. And Jesus said, no, let them grow together. Just leave it up to God. Just live into the kingdom. Well, for the community that Matthew wrote for, for his fledgling Christian Jewish community, the dire consequences had already happened because Matthew wrote 20 years after the Judeo-Roman War in which the nation, the city of Jerusalem, and the temple had been devastated. They had witnessed the end of the age. The world as they knew it had come to an end, and they were waiting to see what would become the new normal. And for that people, the words of Jesus were held up to say Jesus' words were true. His vision was true. His warning was true. And as we live into what will be our new normal, we need to walk in the way of the kingdom, and we need to do that with patience, with faithfulness, and with trust. Okay, so what about us? Well, we live in a time when the world seems to be going to hell in a handbasket. We live at a time when our world is being struck by pandemic, where we see xenophobia, which was being acted out on the basis of race and religion and sexuality. We live in a time in, in which financial uncertainty is terrifying everyone. Sleep is elusive. The world as we know it would seem to be coming to an end. It seems to be the end of an age and people everywhere are talking about the new normal. So what does this gospel have to say to us? Well, because I can never simply talk in a straight direction, let me say this. My favorite stage production of all time was The Man of La Mancha, a ridiculed Don Quixote, a crazy man who believed himself to be a knight of old who would do battle with windmills that he believed to be dragons. At, at the end of the play, as Quixote is dying, he's being held in the arms of a marginalized woman named Aldanza, a woman who had to sell her body to survive. But Quixote had idealized her. He called her Dulcinea, which means sweet one. Much, I might say, to the laughter of the townspeople. But as Quixote is drawing his last breath, Aldonza begins to sing, to dream the impossible dream. There is not a dry eye in the house. And at the end of the song, as the last echoes of the song fade away, one of the townspeople calls out Eldanza in a very lewd way. And she picks herself up and fluffs herself up and says, my name is Dulcinea, the love of, of this crazy, crazy old man had transformed her. He loved her in a way that she had never experienced or imagined could happen. And she was transformed. Never more to be Aldanza, the marginalized prostitute, but Dulcinea, 
the sweet one. I believe that at this point in our time, in this point in our history, our gospel is saying to a people who are trying to sort out what normal is going to look like, dream. Dream what seems to be an impossible dream. Love with an unimaginable love because your love can transform lives. Live with patience and faithfulness and hope and leave the rest to God. You see, Jesus inaugurated the kingdom of God. But that kingdom is present in as much as we accept it, enter into it, live it, and are changed by it. So dream. Dream the impossible dream. Love with unimaginable love. Our love will transform worlds. Our God can transform eternity. Amen.
we say together the Shema, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first and the great commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Let us pray. God, who is full of kindness and love, hear our prayers for the world, for one another and for ourselves. For this congregation and for the church around the world, that we may be faithful and courageous in the face of all challenges that arise day by day. Lord, in your love, hear our prayer. For mercy, justice, understanding, and peace in relationships between nations. That in this time of anxiety about the future, there will still be generosity for all in need. Lord, in your love, hear our prayer. For those who work in fields and forests, in mines and offices, in hospitals, schools and shops, and for those who cannot find work. That as the economy is reorganized, all who do work will be fairly treated, and those seeking work will not lose hope. Lord, in your love, hear our prayer. For those who travel by land, air, and on water, and for those on vacation taking time to explore your creation. That as we recover from this pandemic, we will remember to cherish the earth and treat it wisely. Lord, in your love, hear, hear our prayer. For those who are teachers and students, for schools, colleges and universities, who plan for a new season of learning in challenging times that creativity and commitment will lead to discoveries about the world you love and the truth rooted in your wisdom. Lord, in your love, hear, hear our prayer. For all those in danger and need, for the sick and the dying, the poor and the oppressed, for those standing up against injustice, and for all still at risk from COVID-19. Lord, in your love, hear. hear our prayer. For those who are closest to us, for friendships that have stood the test of many years, and for those whose love is enough to tell us the truth about ourselves, that they may know our love and appreciation. Lord, in your love, Hear our prayer. And now, joining our prayers and praises together, we pray in the words that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds, the knowledge and the love of God and of God's Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and those whom you love and pray for today, tomorrow, and forever. Amen. Amen.